Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to the Expo, Expo stage, or as we call it, STPF on the Expo stage. Um, this is going to be a very quick introduction to a very quick experience. There's a growing tradition in the Science and Technology Policy Fellowships program of just sharing their collective experiences. And they do that in this quasi, especially for scientists, fast-paced format of 10 slides for 20 seconds each. And so the brave souls that are joining you today has agreed to join to do this format. So you will see seven 10 by 20 flash talks, approximately 70 slides, seven science policy experiences in 30 minutes. If any of you are interested after the fact of learning more about the ST Policy Fellowships Program, please see my colleague Chris over here in the back and sign our sheet. But first, I will invite up to the stage our first speaker for the afternoon. Hi everyone, I am Sarah Ravito and I am thrilled to be here this morning and kick off the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowships Flash Talks. I am a 2019-2020 IEEE USA Congressional Fellow and you can find me on Twitter at SMR32. First and foremost, if you ever have the opportunity to go on a Capitol Dome tour, the only answer is yes. So how did I get here? I had a very circuitous route to Capitol Hill. I started off in technical engineering roles and gradually became more interested in science policy. After engaging in the advocacy space for a few years, I decided that I wanted to experience Congress from the inside and to better understand how policy is made. So what do I do on Capitol Hill? I work for Congressman Seth Moulton, who represents Massachusetts's 6th district, just north of Boston. It's an honor and a privilege to work for a young, dynamic, engaged member of Congress who is a former Marine and understands the value of service. I am a member of the legislative team and work on a wide variety of science and technology policy issues, from AI to 5G to cyber to recycling. I also perform other duties as assigned, which sometimes include singing holiday carols with the rest of Team Moulton for local New England media. Hashtag regional rail, our office really likes trains. It's also been fascinating to learn about how the House of Representatives functions as a legislative body. You're essentially dealing with 435 different small businesses that all have to follow different processes and procedures in order to come to a consensus and make law. It's also been interesting learning how and when members of Congress vote and how that impacts their schedules. But before a bill can go to the floor, someone needs to come up with an idea and put pen to paper. Again, I came to Congress to understand how the sausage is made with respect to legislation. You can see the many diverse inputs that go into my friend Bill in order for him to be considered for becoming a law. I also cannot understate the value of consensus building. It's also been interesting to learn about the triangular relationship between a member of Congress, the DC office, and the district office. I cannot understate the importance of the district office and their presence in the local community and the constituent services that they provide for the residents of Massachusetts's sixth district. It's also been fun being one of part of one of the most tech-savvy offices on Capitol Hill. Two of my colleagues in the fall gave a presentation on using tech for constituent services. We also have Macs, which is pretty uncommon on the Hill, and use a variety of different software applications to be as efficient and effective as possible. I'd like to take a second to introduce you to my three best friends on Capitol Hill. First and foremost, the Congressional Research Service, informing the legislative debate since 1914. The reports are all publicly available online, crs.congress.gov. Congress.gov is an, an invaluable resource in and with of itself. And finally, this is our office dog, Emmy. She is the best. There's truly something for everyone on Capitol Hill. I got to touch the Stanley Cup and fulfill my lifelong dream of meeting Bill Nye the science guy. This year has been challenging and incredibly rewarding. I feel like I've had an outsized amount of impact and I cannot recommend taking your science and engineering skills to Capitol Hill highly enough. Thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Gillian Bowser. I'm going to be a little bit different. I'm an old fellow, or we in my class call it the gray apples instead of the green apples. Um, so I'm from Colorado State University. I'm an associate professor there. I'm going to take you through a little bit of voyage of what you do after your AAAS fellowship and thinking about things you can do that you probably hadn't thought about and introduce everybody to things with six or eight legs. So I'm going to start from the top of saying I came from Brooklyn, New York as a scientist went to AAAS to learn how to do policy, and then how do I translate that policy back to my students? So I have students at Colorado State, and we work on bugs, and we work in fun places like Yellowstone National Park, and the idea was that how do we boldly go where no scientist or bug person has gone before? So in about eight, seven really quick, easy steps, I want to show you how we got from point A to point B, how do you become a scientist working on bugs, to get that policy piece and then translate it back to a community and have students do all of those steps. And a quick shout out, my students are actually presenting here, so if you could go give them a support, it's their first AAAS experience. Step number one, the next generation. Focus on that next generation through your AAAS experience. How do we get the next generation to navigate the space of international diplomacy? It's not easy, they get lost. How do you go from a field biologist to somebody with a suit on and pass through goodwill on the way to get that suit? So we're trying to figure out how to get students to think about their science and take it into policy. Step number two was then to learn a new language. One of the things we tell our students all the time is you have to pay attention to the language. In diplomacy, every word counts. In entomology, every leg counts. So you need to think about that difference. How do you translate that eight legs, six legs into eight words, six words of diplomacy that has meaning? Step number three, that field experience. So you're out there chasing a bug around in the highlands of Peru or out in the deserts of Colorado, and you need to think about how does that data have application, then how am I going to take that application and translate it to a language that somebody else understands? So we try to provide them that skill set, collect bugs, let's put it into a language. That gets to step number four, which is partnerships, learning how to work with other institutions, other people, other languages, other cultures, and translate that language of bugs into diplomacy or diplomacy back into bugs and get the different cultural perspectives on each organism. And that's really important because landscapes have culture and diplomacy has culture. And that gets me to step five, you need to think about culture. Everything is a multicultural dialogue. And we can argue about the people who study spiders or a different culture than those of us who study things with six legs. But the idea is taking that field setting, translate it into something that has meaning in the diplomacy world, and then actually present that meaning in non-scientific language as to why this is important. We work on pollinators, that's step number six. How do we connect those dots? Take that organism we found in the field, we need to actually put it into why are pollinators declining, why are they important? Consolidate that across cultures. And in this report, there's our pollinator. That's as much data as we got in the final report. Number seven, translate the language of shifts and have a champion who helps you explain that shift. So we take pollinators, we run around the field at 15,000 feet, it's really high, and then we capture pollinators, and we have to translate all that information from pollinators to pictures to this to that to these seven people, which gets me to my final. My AAA experience provided me with the tools to teach the next generation to learn a new language, apply field experience and partnerships with multicultural dialogues, connect the dots, translate it all, and make global questions for societal importance. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, my name is Nick. Uh, I have put up a couple of things. I wanna thank all of the uh, organizations and people who got me here, including my parents who dressed me in weird sunglasses. If any of these logos resonate with you, let me know. We can have a conversation about it. Just wanna uh, make sure uh, I can be a little bit relatable up here. So if you relate, let me know. But today I'm coming to you as a 2019-2020 Congressional Science Fellow. That's me in the back in the little yellow circle. That's also me up front in the very Rococo suit. They made me stand up front because they thought it was a really cute suit. Um, I think so too. Um, if there's anything we learned from this presentation, it's that this could also be uh, my modeling uh, application. So 
Um, I'm currently working for Congressman David Price. He represents the North Carolina 4th District. That's Chapel Hill, Durham, Raleigh, the Research Triangle Park. Um, if you're wondering about the weird shape of that district, we can have a conversation offline about that. Um, but David Price sits on the Appropriations Committee, and, if, and I've highlighted the three appropriations subcommittees that I think the most about in my role. Um, what are some things I do on the job? Well, sometimes I write tweets for the boss. Uh, sometimes I watch really weird YouTube videos that activists send me about birds called the sage grouse. Um, I think the title of the email was like, please save this majestic creature, and we can agree to disagree on that. Um, and sometimes I take meetings from constituent representatives. This is a meeting with the Citizens Climate Lobby. One of the coolest things I get to do is I get to meet really cool people. Um, that's my boss in the middle, the tall white guy. The guy to his uh, left is uh, former Secretary of Transportation, Anthony Fox, who also happens to be the former mayor of my hometown, Charlotte, North Carolina. And I got to meet him at a breakfast one morning, which was super cool. Not pictured, I also got to meet Al Gore a couple weeks ago. Um, but I made these slides before that. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit about the appropriations process. If you Google what's the appropriations process, you get a little diagram like this. Um, here's the thing. This doesn't include all of the incredible stakeholder uh, engagement that goes into creating a budget. Um, a budget isn't just a bunch of people saying, here's what we should give money to. It's a bunch of communities coming to us and asking for money. Um, pictured here is something called the Climate Adaptation Science Centers. The Climate Adaptation Science Centers are all over the country. There's one here at, at the University of Washington. There's also one at North Carolina State University in my boss's district. They came to us and said, we only get $25 million a year. We'd like $38 million so we can make a Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. And we said, here you go. So because a bunch of scientists, and honestly, this was actually what really made it impactful and meaningful to me, is a bunch of PhD students showed up to my office and said, hey, Nick, we really need more money so we can keep doing our good work and keep ad adapting to climate change. And we said, you know what? That's worth it. Let's put that money in the budget because you need it and because we actually all need it. Um, what's coming next? Well, we just, we passed our budget two months ago. Um, no shutdown this year. You're welcome. Um, and we just got the president's budget request on Monday, which means it's already time to start writing a new budget. Uh, there is no rest for the wicked. Um, we will be hopefully not getting a budget out even sooner than December this year. Um, if you have any questions, you want to know more about the budget process, I am in the weeds there. So uh, please get in touch with me. You can email me or email me or t tweet at me. That's a peacock. I thought it was cute. Or look me up on Instagram. That's just for cute pictures. Um, your choice. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Mara Lenick, and I grew up an army brat. So my first STEM experience was in the third grade at the Department of Defense School in Germany. And my project at the science fair was mainly driven by my need to know if Bounty was the quicker picker upper or not. Spoiler alert, it was. Um, and so growing up, moving from school to school, I know that some schools have a lot of money and resources for STEM and science, and others do not. But throughout this, this wavy path here, I had a scatter of experiences that were funded by government and local organizations to help me experience STEM at a young age. Um, and so all of this led me to grad school. And when I got to grad school, I spent a lot of time in a dark room looking at single molecules like in this video here. And while this was cool, I wanted to see what, what was outside the lab. And so I got to experience a week-long program in DC um, experiencing science policy, and this was also funded by NSF, another government organization. And now I live in a sea of alphabet soup in the government, and I work at the National Institute of Health in the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke in the Office of Neuroscience Communication and Engagement. Whew, it's a lot of words, but what does it mean? And so our office mainly does um, communication and engagement. And so for the communication, we help uh, maintain all the websites, social media, and other communication platforms um, to show scientists and the public about neuroscience. We also help convene people together and engage them in neuroscience. Um, through organizing meetings and attending other uh, events. And my projects for my fellowship mainly focus around the BRAIN initiative. 
And this is a collaboration among several uh, federal agencies to help fund innovative neuroscience and tools for neuroscience, including um, making fun uh, uh, tools to uh, image animals um, while they move. And what we want to do with my projects is to use this awesome brain science um, to engage the public and, school and students about science and hopefully maybe one day um, encourage them to be neuroscientists. And so um, with this um, interactive game that we're building, we want to highlight all the animal models and tools that are being developed and take this intense neuroscience and make it into short sound bites that high school students can understand. And I also created this cute little sloth scientist to help encourage um, students to think science is awesome. Um, and also as part of my fellowship, we are also looking to um, do a portfolio analysis of the opportunities in educational training. Um, so I'm looking at what NIH is currently funding and where are their gaps and how can we um, expand on our neuroscience engagement at the NIH. And so with all of these different things that I'm doing for my fellowship, we're trying to increase the amount of STEM experiences um, to feed this st science ecosystem. And so this includes government and academia and industry and nonprofit, but we want to turn these gears in order to um, produce innovative science that helps society in the end. So thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Steph Guerra and I am a AAAS fellow in the VA. The VA is the nation's largest healthcare system and we also have an extensive intramural research program which is embedded in the system. And this means that the research that we do at the VA is very closely linked to the patient care. We characterize these impacts into two categories, policy and clinical practice. The VA has three primary arms the field, which are the medical facilities across the nation, the policy offices in DC, which set clinical practice standards for the field, and the Office of Research and Development, where I am, which funds the researchers. The cool thing about working here is that there's extensive interactions among these three arms. Research that we do in the Office of Research and Development is implemented in evidence-based practices. Some of these are listed here. The field comes to us for the data and evidence to establish them. The policy offices also come to us to set the standards for the field. Policy also interacts greatly with the research. So the policy offices come to the Office of Research and Development for more evidence and data in order to respond to legislation and congressional oversight. Listed here are three of the laws that have had outsized impact on the VA not just clinical practice, but also the research. They actually lead to the funding of new research portfolios in my office. Now, I want to take a quick overview of how I actually got here to the VA. So this journey was sort of winding. I'm a cancer biologist by training, but I did a lot of science communication work during my graduate school experience. This sparked my interest in talking to non-scientists and working in the policy field. I came to DC as a Mir Zion Fellow at the National Academies of Science and ended up here at the VA working in health policy. The great thing about working for the VA is that it's a mission-driven organization. We achieve our mission by working on high-priority clinical issues that are prevalent in the veteran population. This includes things such as suicide prevention and TBI. My work portfolio focuses on opioids and pain management as well as precision oncology. As a cancer researcher, I'm so excited to be involved in a precision oncology initiative, which is a system-wide implementation problem. We're building infrastructure in research and clinical practice so that veterans have the best access to cancer care. Right now, we're focusing on lung cancer and metastatic prostate cancer. Moving forward, I'm also a program manager for two different experimental funding mechanisms in my office. These include the Consortium of Research, which is a group of researchers in pain and opioids management meant to accelerate research impacts through building research networks. Second are the Rivers Projects, which are five-year impact projects meant to implement evidence-based practices and develop new tools and resources for the field. Now, when we have these new experimental funding mechanisms, we actually need new ways to evaluate their impact. Listed here are some of the metrics that we use in my office, and we also ask that our researchers provide an impacts plan at the proposal stage of their projects so we know they're thinking about the impacts over the impact factors of their work. 
And so I hope I've given you a little bit of a sense of what it's like working for a learning healthcare system where research really influences practice and policy. I'm very happy to continue this conversation beyond these 200 seconds. So feel free to find me throughout the meeting or connect with me on Twitter. I'm at Steph underscore Guerra. Thank you so much. All right, hello everyone. My name is Scott Sellers. Uh, I'm a second year AAAS fellow. And with this very short time we have together, I'm gonna to tell you a story. And this is kind of my story on how I got to the US State Department uh, through, of course, the AAAS Fellowship. So I have to kind of take you back to where this all started and where it began was in uh, at UC San Diego where I was a postdoc at Scripps Institution of uh, Oceanography. And before I get there, I'm gonna actually share with you that the U.S. State Department, of course, is the number one, or not necessarily the number one, but it is the uh, foreign policy lead for the U.S. federal government. And, uh, and has a mission, of course, to support foreign policy and diplomacy around the world. And you might ask, well, how did an academic get to uh, that, that place? Well, of course, uh, you have to have some sort of deep interest in policy. This was actually my uh, office view where I studied water resource management at Scripps. I uh, did uh, the CCST uh, pol uh, Policy Fellowship in Sacramento, and it kind of hooked me. I was like, I have to better understand policy, and the, on the federal level, on the state level, and so I had to put down my research, which I loved so much, in order to do that, and to take that risk and kind of explore a new area that I was um, gonna be a part of. And of course, I, I looked at high dimensional uh, data sets using data mining techniques, and loved my research, uh, which uh, I performed at UC San Diego, and UC Irvine, and then of course uh, decided to pack up the family and move to DC. And so that move, of course, that decision was uh, a very big, um, let's just say, life-changing experience, right? I mean, you're leaving your academic bubble to, to go and explore the federal government. And uh, when I originally applied for this uh, fellowship, it was in the election season of 2016. So a lot of things changed when I arrived in DC. And of course, I landed at a fabulous office, the National Science Foundation, for my first year. It was the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure. If you're a computer geek or a computer nerd, this is your office. They fund all the supercomputers at universities, international networking infrastructure, cyber infrastructure, data, software, artificial intelligence. They do everything. And, and they really, really, really provide all the funding for, uh, or 80% of the funding for computer scientists. Uh, but deep down, I, I gained an unexpected interest in foreign policy and international collaborations through some of the networking projects I was working on. And so I decided to re-enter the pool and re-interview and was able to obtain a, an offer at the U.S. State Department at the Office of Science and Technology Cooperation. And I showed you those pictures a second ago because um, if you learn anything about the federal government, sometimes things take a while. And I had to work from my basement in Virginia for six months while I waited for the paperwork to go through. But uh, it all worked out and I ended up now at the STC office. We protect American scientific dominance. We uh, advance foreign policy through science. And of course, we, um, we advance our economic security. And I put up this slide because I found myself in this very complex space of geo geopolitical landscape change and how science and technology fits into it, right? The core values of science and research and how it plays into these larger pictures of international collaborations and partnerships and what that means. And so we're, wa we're working very hard to advocate for fundamental principles in science and technology every day. And uh, that goes for um, being at a state visit for the Prime Minister of Australia, which is one of part of my portfolio now, to traveling to Australia and talking with their academies about foundational values of science and technology. And then uh, I put this uh, picture from uh, Air New Zealand. If you ever get a chance to fly to New Zealand and they give you ice cream, just try it, trust me. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Hi, I'm Wynne Meyer, an Ohio-raised evolutionary geneticist, former a cappella singer, and uh, AAAS Policy Fellow at NIH. And I'm Goli Yamini, a lo DC local biophysicist and mother of two boys, and um, a SCP Fellow at the National Science Foundation. And this is our cross-agency love, love story. story. 
Uh, my host agency, the National Science Foundation, where discoveries began, was founded 70 years ago uh, to progress, to promote the progression of science and funds basic research in a lot of different disciplines, uh, notably computer science, uh, where 82% of academic research in computer science is funded by the NSF and has led to many successful companies like Google. Um, the program that I work with is called Smart and Connected Health. It's a cross-cutting uh, initiative and addresses to, I mean, focuses on addressing health problems through basic computer science, engineering, and social and behavioral science uh, research. Imagine if Louis Pasteur was a computer scientist, like how would he address health questions? My agency, the National Institutes of Health, is the largest public funder of biomedical research in the world. Nowadays, understanding the causes of and ways to treat disease uh, require combining biology with data and computer science to understand the petabytes of data being generated through medical images, electronic health records, and whole genome sequences. So my office, the Office of Data Science Strategy, uh, is tasked with helping NIH to deal with this deluge of data and questions like, where should it go? How can we share it while preserving its privacy? And how can we make sense of it all? One of our many programs, the Data Scholars Program, brings in industry computer science and data experts to work alongside biomedical experts to address these questions. Our agency's initial meet cute went something like this. Those health data sets, and those health questions and data sets ignite the fires of my passion for science. Wow, the computer science skills of my dreams. We're, We're a perfect, perfect match. match. But it took more than chemistry to cement our relationship. We needed to put a ring on it and make things official with a big fat MOU. Through ongoing coordination, uh, we've joined strengths to support research at the intersection of data and health, and we're expanding to provide training opportunities for undergrads and underrepresented groups. Uh, this growing relationship promises a harmonious future. Imagine science and health. But wait, we think about it day and night. It's only right to think about the way things are and make them right. We're, we're stronger, stronger together. together. If I take a paper cup with app of mine, and it said that your baby's fine and ease your mind, imagine how the world could be so very fine. The future is brighter. I can't see why robots can't make a sense touch in our life. Pairing doctors and engineers is a rush. It's just right. Sleep studies. Studies of sleep. Nowadays we use AI to take a peep. The only way to make things right is it's seamlessly. seamlessly. It's 2020, remember? So what's the future for this relationship? Mm -hmm. What does the future mm -hmm. hold? We, um, this, the, with the predominance of AI and other advancing technologies that, and the diversing workforce, there's so much to be done and we're set to deal with it all. And we're hoping that this relationship can be a good model for other interagency relationships, showing them what a successful romance can look like. We're, we're stronger, stronger together. together. Please join me once again for th and thank everyone who presented today. Thank you all so much for joining us. <laughs> have the great rest of the day. And if you have any questions, most of these fellows throughout the event will be at our booth over in the AAAS Pavilion. Take care. <laughs>